So even today, we still don't really have a very good idea about how life evolved on our planet. But we do believe that there were very likely several major steps, with life becoming more and more complex during some very specific periods. So for example, 500 to 600 million years ago, that's when a lot of complex life on the planet started to produce various organs, so for example things like eyes, brains and so on, and started to organize into much more complex creatures, whereas a few hundred million years prior to that, we also have the formation of some of the first multicellular life. Then if you go back approximately two and a half billion years ago, we have the sudden appearance of life producing oxygen. But one of the more important events that happened in the history of the biosphere is the sudden appearance of the eukaryotic cells. The types of cells that we are made out of and pretty much everything around us, and the cells that are way more complex than your typical bacteria. And so generally the tree of life in this case sort of looks like this. You have plants, fungi, animals and protista as complex eukaryotes, and on the bottom you have bacteria and archaea as the simple prokaryotes with bacteria and archaea being some of the first cells on the planet. And this particular divide is super important because it essentially suddenly allowed the life to become more complex and to go from just being this to now being able to create much more complex organisms, something that would be impossible for a simple bacteria. But this is a bit of a mystery. We still don't really understand how the cells went from just being bacteria to suddenly becoming so complex and then allowing other life to evolve. And that's important to understand if we ever want to find out if this can happen on other planets. Today, most of the explanations and modern models are relatively simple. They essentially always start with a simple bacteria or a prokaryote, which kind of starts to acquire new organs or somehow starts to organize into more complex cells and eventually turns into a eukaryote, very likely by absorbing some of the other stuff, such as, for example, archaic bacteria, which create new functions inside the cell. And so here at the end we get something that has cyanobacterium or mitochondrion functioning inside the cell and eventually becoming a part of it. Now we know that all our cells have mitochondria and mitochondria have their own DNA, which does imply that they used to be archaic bacteria that lived separately, but eventually kind of became part of us. But this doesn't actually explain how any of this happened, or more importantly, why it happened. And so if cyanobacteria became chloroplasts in plants and some kind of an archaea bacteria became our mitochondria, what's the actual process here? What exactly led to what and how did all of this happen? Well, up until now it was all more or less hypothetical, but in the last 10 years or so, the scientists have discovered several major clues that potentially lead us to an answer. And the answer here is something else that we're missing from the picture. It might actually have something to do with viruses interacting with various ancient cells. So here's what we know so far and here's what the scientists discovered. There's a very interesting location in the Arctic Ocean known as the Lokis Castle. In a nutshell, it's a type of a hydrothermal vent that produces a lot of emissions from the volcanic activity underneath. It was only discovered about a decade ago, but it's already provided quite a lot of interesting discoveries, especially in regards to the type of bacteria living in this region. And we actually believe today that a lot of early life very likely formed around these hydrothermal vents on early Earth, with potentially other types of life evolving here over time. Today they're known as some of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. There's actually, as you can see, quite a lot of life here thriving at all times. And so one of these vents in the Arctic has actually been analyzed by some of the scientists and they discovered that there is quite a lot of interesting bacteria here that does not exist in a lot of other regions. And specifically, they often contained unique types of archaea or ancient bacteria that are particularly interesting to scientists trying to study the evolution of life. And some of the first discoveries back in 2010 found new type of archaea that the scientists decided to name Loki Archaeota, or basically the residents of Loki's castle. And this name suits the archaea very well, for one reason. Loki is described as a complex, confusing and ambivalent figure who is also usually a catalyst for a lot of unresolved controversies. This bacteria was now doing the same. It wasn't clear what this bacteria is and it was creating new mysteries. Mysteries in regards to the evolution of early cells. A few years later, the scientists identified another type of a bacteria, very similar to this one, that they decided to name Tor Archaeota, with Tor obviously being another god from the uh, Norse mythology. Although these ones were found in the river in North Carolina. With other bacteria discovered in Japan, also being named Odin Archaeota and Heimdall Archaeota, 
all of them named after Norse gods. And eventually this created a kind of a super phylum for all of these bacteria that the scientists today refer to as Asgard. These are now known as the Asgard Archaea or Asgard Bacteria. And they've officially now become some of the most important bacteria discovered in the last decade. And mostly because they seem to encode various proteins that are known as the eukaryotic signature proteins. They seem to actually have a lot of features that normally are present only in complex eukaryotic cells, or basically features that are usually present in our cells, but not in the bacterial cells. So just as an example, they're able to create certain types of actins, which very often serve as proteins, creating different types of rigid structures inside more complex cells. These particular proteins have never been found in bacteria, but seem to be present in these particular archaea. They also seem to be able to form various types of vesicles in order to transport materials on the inside and do so very similar to how our cells do it, with a lot of other really complex features that are very often absent in bacteria but present in eukaryotes. But they're still not as complex as our cells. As a matter of fact, when it comes to producing energy, they generally do so in some of the more extreme ways, for example through various types of chemical reactions or very often involving things like sulfur, things like methane, and a lot of other chemicals that are quite abundant in these conditions, but are not as abundant on the surface of the planet. So in that sense, there's still more or less bacteria. But a few other discoveries in the last few years really kind of shocked the scientists. First one was from this bacterium known as Candidatus prometheorchaeum, one of the members of Lochiarchaeota. And in this case, it was doing something known as cross-feeding with two different bacterial species. Or in other words, it was basically doing a kind of a symbiosis. The bacteria was providing something to it, and it was then providing something else to the bacteria, or actually two different bacteria, which is pretty much the exact relationship we see in our cells today. Mitochondria provide something to the cell, and the cell then protects and provides for mitochondria. In other words, the scientists discovered the analogy for what they think might have happened 2 billion years ago when the eukaryotic cells originally started to appear on the planet. But how did all of this occur and what exactly was happening here? Well, at first the scientists were not really clear what's going on and how all of this works. But the clues from this recent paper might have actually found some of the answers. And as I mentioned before, the answers seem to be in viruses. Several families of different viruses might actually be associated with Asgard archaea and seem to be responsible for helping them interact with other bacteria. Although, maybe that's not the right term. They're not really helping them, they're doing the virus thing. They're infecting things, they're creating more viruses, but by doing so, they're actually spreading the genes between various cells. And all of this kind of relates to this other hypothesis, known as viral eukaryogenesis. The idea that viruses very likely played a super important role in helping a lot of cells advance and in helping a lot of cells evolve into what they are today. And this should not really come as a surprise. We know that viruses are pretty much everywhere in nature, and they infect everything. But more importantly, pretty much all of the organisms on the planet contain at least a certain percentage of viruses in their DNA. In our own genes, we have approximately 7%. And this implies that in the past, viruses very likely help modify the DNA of various organisms, which over time help the organisms change and evolve into something they are today. But in this case, these six types of viruses were quite unique, but at the same time had features that would be kind of similar to the bacterial viruses and the eukaryotic viruses, suggesting that the viruses infecting these archaea might have also been able to infect certain bacteria and thus both mix and contribute DNA from one organism to the other. But more importantly, they might have also served as a delivery system to some of the early eukaryote cells as well, with these new viruses having features that are very similar to the viruses that often infect eukaryotes, including the ability to copy their own DNA. Or in other words, these new viruses discovered in this study seem to actually possess features that would allow them to infect pretty much all of the cells on the planet, at least to some extent. And by doing so, they could then reshuffle the DNA from one thing to the other. And because today the scientists believe that the first eukaryotes were very likely direct descendants of early Asgard archaea, it really looks like the DNA in these early bacteria were modified by the viruses discovered in the study, or the ones similar to them. Or in other words, by interacting with both bacteria and archaea, these early viruses very likely contributed genetic components to the early eukaryotic cells, with these particular newly discovered viruses being able to hijack certain types of components that are only present in our cells, eukaryotic cells, but not in bacteria, 
which makes it even more compelling to kind of assume that maybe these viruses were part of the evolution and help these more complex cells eventually form into what we are today. And so what all of this implies is that the evolution of early life was an extremely complex process and actually involved a lot of different components from the biosphere. It involved bacteria, it involved archaea, but it also involved viruses. And their super complex interaction eventually produced the eukaryotic cells that represent the foundation for modern complex life on the planet. But the actual genetic mixing and the introduction of certain genes was done by these viruses. With the evidence for all of this also being in our own genes today. And you can actually learn a little bit more about this in one of the older videos on the channel that should be somewhere in the description or somewhere right there. So yeah, you are about 7% virus as well in terms of your genes. But at least for now this is still just a hypothesis and would definitely require more proof and more evidence from other studies and from other discoveries. Still quite interesting and quite intriguing. Once we learn something else about the origin of life on our planet, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, check out the previous videos on similar topics and subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.